Okay, <laughs> very glad I could get this going. All right, so welcome to um, our latest edition of the Radical Philosophy Hour put on by the Radical Philosophy Association. Um, I hope uh, that everyone is able to join us and tune in. Uh, it's gonna be a good time. Um, just to let everybody know, we're gonna resume monthly uh, editions of the Radical Philosophy Hour uh, here in January and continuing on. So, so look in February for our upcoming um, edition of the Radical Philosophy Hour. Uh, typically, the Radical Philosophy Hour will take place on the first Monday of the month, and generally speaking, be uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. So generally 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the first Monday. Unfortunately, none of those things are true today, but that's okay. I think we can handle it. Um, today, luckily, we are joined by two uh, very wonderful and interesting scholars. We have with us um, Kevin Thompson and Perry Zern. Um, Kevin is professor of philosophy at DePaul University. His areas of specialization are German idealism uh, or include German idealism. Obviously, uh, today we'll be talking with this about a topic, a little bit of field, I think, of German idealism, but that includes other things like contemporary French philosophy, which is really what he's talking about today. He's author of Hegel's Theory of Normativity, uh, co-editor of Phenomenology of the Political, and uh, as we're gonna talk about today, Intolerable Writings from Michel Foucault and the Prisons Information Group, 1970 to 1980. Uh, Kevin is joined by Perry Zern. Uh, Perry is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at American University. Uh, Perry studies forces and histories of change, focusing on the power of curiosity, political resistance, and transgender life. He's the author of Curiosity and Power, The Politics of Inquiry, and co-author of Curious Minds, uh, which is forthcoming from the MIT Press. Obviously, he's also the co-editor, or rather not obviously, uh, also the co-editor of Active Intolerance, Michel Foucault and the Prisons Information Group and the Future of Abolition, uh, as well as a series of other works, including what we'll be talking about today, which is the new work, Intolerable Writings from Michel Foucault and the Prison Information Group. Uh, just to give an idea of what we'll be talking about today, um, we're going to be looking at questions of abolition and prison resistance, especially as these emerged within the prisons information group. So with all that said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kevin and Perry. Uh, we're going to be functioning a little bit differently today than we normally do. So they'll be leading the conversation for the most part. Uh, but I don't think reading papers so much as having a conversation. And uh, then I'll be jumping in toward the end. So without further ado, uh, Perry, Kevin, take it away. Thanks so much, Brandon. We're really excited to be here. Thanks for hosting the Radical Philosophy Hour in general and us um, on it today. We did want to start with a, a more conversational, informal conversation about the book, Intolerables, what's exciting about it, what's in it, how did it come to be to begin with. Um, I guess we'll, we'll be kind of fielding each other some questions here, and I'll start by kicking it to Kevin and saying, how did, how did you get this idea to begin with? How did we, how did we get here? Well, that's a long story, as you know, Perry, but let's let's start with the, the beginnings of it. So I was working in Foucault and working on the question of uh, actually a question I took over from a rent, frankly, uh, trying to think it uh, through the Foucauldian framework. And that is the question or problem of judgment, right, political judgment in particular, but uh, judgment uh, more broadly. And in doing that, I uh, was drawn to uh, texts that weren't, you know, the histories that Foucault had published, but texts where he had actually engaged in political activism himself made, you know, was in the act of political judgment himself. And how did that work? And how did that, um, how did that operate? And I found myself pretty quickly in the prison's information group, what we call uh, by its French acronym, I imagine he's about to say Jeep there. <laughs> yeah. You know, so uh, uh, we have all sorts of people who are working in the field. And so when we were meeting at the Foucault Circle one year, we were talking about, well, what could we do for a, a text seminar that we would use for the following year's uh, program? And uh, I made the suggestion, well, there's a ton of literature uh, on the JEEP, uh, Prisons Information Group, that we've never really talked about terribly much here, and it would be really insightful and useful and innovative to do so. That's putting together the program, putting together that selection of texts 
for that first tech seminar at that Foucault Circle is really where the, the genesis of this program, this book began. At that point, just to be uh, uh, clear about this, I thought it would be maybe five, six texts, right? I had no other earthly idea it would expand into 430 uh, pages worth of text, uh, but uh, that is what it did. And that's where Perry came in was when in the um, transition into that uh, program. Uh, so Perry, I'll let you take it up from there. Yeah, so we had, um, so Kevin was was generous, generous enough to invite me as kind of onto the project. And I was, I was immediately interested. I had already been interested in Foucault in general. And I was also, uh, I think, personally and professionally interested in how it is that um, disciplinary mechanisms uh, uh, are saturated within particular institutions and how those mechanisms differ from institution to institution, but also how they um, kind of span across. So Foucault's analysis in Discipline and Punish of, you know, the discipline of handwriting in schools and kind of the structure of classrooms had, you know, captured my mind. And, and certainly I thought in, in some sense, how interesting that we could think about disciplinary and specifically carceral logics um, that span more than the prison itself. So all of this to say, um, I, was, I was very interested in this particular archive and also to be thinking about Foucault as an activist, as someone who is learning on the ground before writing for, in some sense from above or as a refusal of writing from above. Um, so yeah, we, we got together a, a short list of texts and started doing some of the translation work and it did, it just blossomed beyond, beyond that. We started thinking about doing you know, a full special journal issue, maybe in Foucault studies, and then there were, there were more texts still than that. And finally we we're like, no, this is gonna be a book. This is gonna be a big book. And we're going to, we really want it to be a, a manual, kind of a, a tool to, to digest a lot of the French material that's available into English. Um, or Anglophone kind of speaking worlds. And that's important, right? To make this archive accessible was, was I think what, what drove us. And we were really lucky to, uh, uh, given all of that translation work and I was at that point, um, you know, on the market and then at different, you know, kind of jobs at postdoc and then at VAP and then starting this job. And so we, we were able to bring on Eric Berenick um, who's a good friend of mine, right? Somebody I just like as a person and, and who has an incredible ear for the French. We're able to bring him on as a second translator. And uh, I feel as though it, it certainly wouldn't be out this year if it weren't for him. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, 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 we're very grateful um, about that. So I thought the next thing we would talk about, Perry, would be the genesis actually of the Jeep itself, right, where they came from. So I'll give sort of the initial facts uh, of the matter, then we can go back and forth and talk a little bit about different sort of highlights or interests we have in that, in that genesis itself and the context. So the broad context is something like this, right? The Jeep is formally begun in uh, January, sorry, February of 1971. They put out an announcement. They've uh, started this group. It's signed by Michel Foucault, uh, Jean-Marie Dominac, and Pierre Vidal Naki. Uh, they are the intellectual sort of front line of, of the organization, but they're really just the protectors of the organization, uh, the uh, intellectual fronts for the uh, organization itself. As we'll talk about in just a little bit, the JIT was incredibly de uh, centralized and de hierarchized. So it was really a, an innovative group in, in all sorts of ways. But that's who signed the original declaration, the original manifesto, so to speak, is, comes out of that as well. But the, the actual sort of background for, and it only lasted, we should say, through 1973, the beginning of 1973, they had dissolved even before that, but the, the final issue of, of, uh, of the intolerable series that they were producing, the pamphlets that they were producing came out in 1973. So very short span of time in which they were operative, but they, they did a lot of really significant things and a lot of significant work. And a lot of stuff came out of that very short span of time. But they really began in 1970 and just before. They're part of the, the wave of post 68 French radicalism, in particular Maoist circles uh, that were uh, growing up around this period. Some of the Maoists uh, had been imprisoned uh, because of their advocacy of uh, what would deem by the state to be terrorist actions. Uh, and uh, there was a support group that grew up around that. Foucault's um, partner, uh, Daniel Defer, his longtime partner, uh, was involved in that group and became especially involved in the support network for the editors. And Defer said, we really need to have uh, some kind of group, some kind of organization would come together and think about 
uh, the prison more broadly, not just about these incarcerated intellectuals. Um, they initially sought for their uh, political prisoner status and DeFer and the others were saying, well, that's what we need to push for. But they began to realize, no, we need to push for them to, to be thought of as common prisoners because that's really what they were. And think about, as Perry was mentioning, carceral logics more generally. Um, and that's when he said, well, I can, you know, if we have this kind of organization, uh, we can do a kind of tribunal like Sartre was doing with uh, organizations at the time. And we can bring in Foucault, right? Because he's my partner, we can, he'll be involved in this and I think I can get him to sign on to it. Um, he was willing to sign on to it. In December of 1970, they met at his and DeFerre's apartment in Paris and uh, began uh, what became the Jeep. But uh, Foucault immediately said, this tribunal idea is a problem because it plays into disciplinary carceral logic itself. It just replays the system rather than challenging the system. So what we need to do is try to make um, uh, uh, apparent what's been hidden and what's been held clandestinely. And that is what goes on in prisons, just literally what goes on in prisons themselves. Hence, he said, we need to be an information group rather than a tribunal or other kind of group. And that's really the origins of the Jeep itself. That's where it really came from. And that idea of that in making information, or as DeFerre famously said, and what's really another manifesto of the group, that information is itself a struggle, um, I think is really, really the, the, the significant uh, birth of the organization itself is in that idea. Perry, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I would just add two things. One, one at the front end and one, and one at the back end sort of of, of the Jeep's formation. And that is to underscore something that um, something that Kevin just mentioned, which is that um, this was this started in a sense with the some of the organizers of May sixty eight being incarcerated, and saying, "Yo, the prisons are a problem," and there was a temptation at that specific moment to think about political prisoners as the ones who were more innocent, who deserved more rights, who should be released faster. But there was a decision there in the face of that temptation to say, no, we need to address the prison as a whole, the structure as a whole, and not to fall into this common law prisoner versus political prisoner, more deserving, less deserving, more guilty, less guilty, whatever. And I think that that insistence on coalition across difference there is in microcosm a, a real significant strength of the Jeep. So whether that's then from incarcerated people in general to those outside and who outside and when, and even those outside and the kind of coalitions that they were building across not only um, geographical location, but kind of political investment and, and um, even, even roles or not roles or relations or not relations with the prison. There's just a lot of coalition across, across difference to address a thing that is a problem an intolerable problem for them, and that is the prison. So that's that's on the, at, at the beginning of the Jeep. I think that's a really important moment. And then toward the end, right? So they're very active for the next several years and, and really disband around early 1973. And they do so in favor, not just kind of giving up to say, oh, we haven't done anything or give, saying, oh, great, we've done everything we can do, but rather to, set, to pass the baton on to say, and now we will sort of, as the Jeep, we will play a supporting role to a new organization called the Prisoners Action Committee or the CAP, which ended up being active um, well into the early 1980s and was involved um, in helping to abolish the, the death penalty in France in 1981. So lots of strong uh, coalitional um, energy at the beginning and at the end of the Jeep. Yeah, and importantly, that, that organization, the CAP was prisoner led. Right, so I, I, that's an incredibly important aspect of this is this really was uh, Foucault and the other intellectuals handing over leadership of an organization, passing the baton on, as Perry was saying, to a group that was now not just letting the prisoners speak, but actually the prisoners were directing the group fully and wholly themselves, right? So uh, I think it's a kind of natural transition in that regard, right? So you could say the Jeep's legacy continued on at least through 1980, 81, and, and, and further on. There's a group in France even today that's called Info Prisons that does exactly the same work uh, to this day, um, uh, putting out information about prison life and cars well, the carceral logic of, of society more broadly, uh, even to this day. So it, it's had a long and continuing life. Uh, I think it's really important to know. Um, so Perry, I'll, I'll let you go here. You can 
introduce the next yeah topic. well you're touching you're touching on it um already or we've touched on it in several ways but what what is really the heart of the jeep right what how would we distill um what the jeep is really about yeah so i i think there's really a couple of things there to, that really distinguish the jeep and and there are many more, so we'll have much more to talk about here, but let me at least put two on the table. One we've already mentioned, that is this idea that information itself is part of the struggle, right? So there have been a long tradition, particularly in Maoist circles of, uh, and this goes all the way back to Marx actually, of using investigation and inquiry as a tool for emancipatory struggle. Um, and so that's, in one sense, that's always been thought of as part of the, the repertoire of uh, an activist intellectual, Marx is the paradigm for this, of actually investigating working conditions themselves. So going literally standard way of doing this in, in Maoist uh, groups was go literally to the factory. So they would stand outside of the Renault factory, for example, and collect information from uh, the workers about what was going on in the factory itself and how, what was just everyday life like in the factory. So documentary, uh, documentarian uh, emphasis in, in documenting that kind of life. And the Jeep clearly picks up on this, right? The Jeep clearly picks up on this idea that information itself is part of the struggle. And they make it more central than it ever had been before in any of the other um, uh, organizations that preceded them. And because it wasn't about just collecting uh, documentary evidence and you know, making that part of a kind of ideological uh, agenda and proposal, which is what you see more in the Mao Maoist uh, version of this, but just putting the information out there itself because they believed that information itself was sufficient to raise the problem of what's intolerable and what we ought to be intolerant of, uh, that, that, was, that that was enough, right? Whether they were right about that, we can talk about it, but that was, that was at least the central idea that if, if we're gonna be able to talk about this, we have to be, to use a later expression, truth tellers about the nature of prison life on an everyday level. So that's the first thing is information struggle. The second thing I would say is, uh, and that's a tactical um, uh, innovation, I would say, of, of, of the sheep. The other one I wanna talk about is organizational, right? And I alluded to this just a moment ago. And that is though they had an intellectual front, they had Foucault, Dominic, and, and Naki as their intellectual fonts, all well-known established intellectuals uh, Foucault is, you know, professor at this point at the Collège de France. So, you know, they've all of them have, have risen to the heights of academic uh, excellence in their country and recognition and prestige. And they use that prestige to protect the organization. But what they did not do, and I think this is really important, we tried, as Perry will talk perhaps more about this, we struggled immensely to try to de-emphasize Foucault as being central to uh, the Jeep, because he wasn't in one sense. I mean, yes, of course, there was no Jeep without Foucault, right? He came up with the idea. It, they met in Defer and, and his apartment. They literally stuffed envelopes there. The prisoners came there. I mean, all those things, all the, all the early um, uh, announcements are of meetings that are taking place at Foucault's house. I mean, that's literally his apartment. That's literally how things were going. But he was not the, you know, sort of avant-garde director of the organization itself, right? Um, he, and so this is why this is why the vast majority of the materials uh, that was produced by the Jeep was produced anonymously because they wanted to have a decentralized, de um, um alliance. They thought of themselves as a relay station, right? As, a, as a, an attack front, a front of attack. And that's the way, that's what they wanted to be. They wanted to be supple. They wanted to be non-hierarchical to facilitate that. So even the Paris Jeep, which then spawned various Jeeps out in the various provinces, they maintained relationships with one another, but not a hierarchical relation. They were all lateral relations. They were interested and supportive of one another's initiatives. We have documents in the archive of them talking to one another. Here's the axes we ought to be pursuing and struggling for. So they were you know, collaborative and deliberative with one another about the tactics and strategies that they were pursuing, but they were not, you know, wasn't centralized. Well, we have to wait and see what the Paris Jeep tells us to do if we're out in tool or someplace else. They were able to act on their own initiatives and work collaboratively across one another. So I think that that's really important because unlike most of the post 68, um, or I should say a lot of the post 68 uh, groups, they were not decidedly not hierarchical in their organization. Here, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I would add that one of the one of the mottos of the Jeep was donner la parole, which is to give the floor or, or to give speech in a sense. But but we we translate it as to give the floor because the the idea was to say again, folks on the outside, 
don't have a right to stand up and say, this is what's going on in the prison. And hey, I got an idea how to fix it. You know, um, it's more of, is, is it critically important as a foundational move of alliance to say, what, what is going on, right? Let the prisoners say what is going on. Let them theorize what it is that needs to be changed. Document that, get that out, support that, lift that up. Um, so that is the, uh, I think that is one of the heartbeats of the organization. And then I would simply return to something Kevin said about, about information being a struggle. And I think some of the complexities around this are really interesting. Um, it's certainly the case that the Jeep understood its emphasis on information gathering and dissemination as part of its um, kind of first round minimalist um, work of allyship. And that was to say, we're not here to fix it. We're here to listen. We're here to move the information. But there was all, there's also a way in which the role of information in the Jeep lent itself to some reform activity during the Jeep's um, work. So at the time, um, radios were sort of forbidden in most prisons, television was forbidden, there were a lot of revocations of newspapers and magazines that weren't allowed in. Um, and even if some of them were allowed in, the folks in charge would sort of cut different articles out or pictures out so that the so that the prisoners wouldn't be wouldn't know what's going on in the world, essentially, would be would be disempowered with, from the knowledge of, of what's going on, and especially of what's going on around issues of prison kind of awareness being being raised. So, um, and in addition to that, I should say there was also a lot of censoring of letters. So there was a lot of um, ref like re return of prisoners' letters saying you can't talk about politics, you can't talk about the world, you can't talk about news, talk about the personal, right? Personal, not the political. Uh, and, and there was a lot of work that happened just naturally given the Jeep's kind of um, relationship to and raising what raising the voices of, of prisoners higher up, right? Kind of um, uh, allowing them to resonate more powerfully in, in certain places. There's a lot of energy that allowed some of the information to be, to be allowed in. So to get radios in prisons, to get more newspapers in prisons, to get a little bit of a, a lessening of censorship. So there was some element of reform in its emphasis on information that happened, I think, naturally. It's not what it set out to do at the Jeep, but happened naturally. And then something that we've, um, I think Andrew and I have argued in, in several places, is that there's a way in which the Jeep's emphasis on information and giving the floor to prisoners is also abolitionist in some sense. So if, if the prison itself as an institution is founded on an assumption that um, prisoners ought not to have a voice about what's happening to them or don't have the insight relevant to uh, establishing or applying justice, then insisting that they do cuts at the very foundation of what the prison is. So there's a sense in which one could argue that the, the Jeep's emphasis on information and their activism around information is uh, fundamentally abolitionist. But I just want to pull that out that, the, that their, their work with information is really, um, is so rich all the way through what they do. And I think there's a lot of different ways to read and, and to see. Um, but given that, let's, let's turn uh, to the question of the relationship between the Jeep and Foucault. So Kevin is right, we've tried to consistently remind ourselves the Jeep is the Jeep. The Jeep is not Foucault's pet. <laughs> um, there's, there's a, or just an outgrowth of his own, of his own mind. Right? The Jeep was something that taught him things. Um, so what are those things, right? What are the ways in which, what are the things he was in a sense to the Jeep and what was its role in, in, his, in his development? Kevin? Yeah, so I appreciate this because I think this is really significant that uh, as Perry was just saying, we do want to de-emphasize the centrality. It was not Foucault's pet project, this Jeep thing that he also did and he was a great intellectual. He really did learn things from his involvement with these other uh, people. And he tells us this. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting now because when you read Discipline and Punish, this is obviously uh, the, one of the things that one of the things that uh, grew out of his work here. It's not the only. Um, but he tells you right in the opening chapters that, you know, I learned about the materiality of prison life. I learned about that prison life and incarceration more broadly is about the materiality of life. I learned that from the struggles that were going on in the prison revolts. Well, we now know, right, that his own work with the Jeep was in support of those revolts. They happened in 71 over to 72. They began in Toul and went through many of the prisons uh, in, uh, over the course of, of that year. And the Jeep was, in fact, at sometimes accused by the government of having 
um, fomented these revolts, have been the cause of the revolts. And they always said, no, we're just supporting what the prisoners are doing when, when they rise up, when there's an uprising in the prison, we support their uprising because we want them uh, to be heard. We wanna give them the floor and let them uh, speak uh, their grievances. And so they famously uh, published a booklet of all the grievances. They collected all the grievances from, um, the, um, from the work there published that and it's about the most mundane things in, you know, it's not, well, we're incarcerated and we don't really want to be incarcerated. It's, we don't have access to hot water. We don't have access to food. Uh, it's cold here. We don't have access to warm. It's about, as, as, as we've heard it called at one point, creaturely matters, right? Creaturely politics, very basic fundamental. Well, if you think about discipline and punish, that's what the microphysics of power is all about. It's not about top-down oppression in that sense. Of course, Foucault never denied that there is uh, oppression that takes place, domination, control, restraint in that, in that kind of sense. But he was also adamant that if you want to understand that as the, the limits of an extreme, you've also got to understand the very mundane microphysical ways in which power operates through, as, as Perry was mentioning earlier, through the gesture, right? Through the very basic ways in which space and time and procedures and practices, all the things that Foucault would call disciplinary power, uh, uh, operate in our lives and, and in that way frame and shape our, and mold our behavior. Well, those ideas about the, you know, the banality of power, to use that kind of language for it, um, he tells us it came out of these, um, came out of this prison revolts, which he had been an activist supporting. So he learned that from them, right? So I think it's important to realize that the whole sort of what we like to call Foucauldian understanding of power, right, is largely indebted. Right? You really see this reflected in the lecture courses from those years at the Collège de France as well. He's struggling with, is power simply repression or is it something more? And the, the answer is ultimately it's something more than just simply repression, domination, uh, control. And he's learned that in the practical sphere from seeing prisoners tell him that, look, my everyday life, my carcerated life is shaped and molded by the everyday decisions and the everyday restrictions and permissions that are granted within this space and the time that it's organized and ordered under. So that's really where the microphysics, the disciplinary conception of power. So the, you know, we like to call it panopticism. Panopticism, he, he, you know, is a diagram for understanding how power operates. It's not how prisons were built, right? We know that uh, most prisons were not built on the panoptical model that Bentham uh, originated, but the, it, is a, it, is a, it is a picture, a model for how power operates. And he learned that, Foucault did, he really saw that in the Jeep. Now, you know, we document that a lot of times by saying, well, when he walked out of Attica, because he visited Attica in upper, upstate New York, just outside of Buffalo, he visited there in, in April of 1972, he, walked, he met with the um, uh, committee that had been formed there in the wake of the Attica uprising that had happened in September of the previous year. So just to get a context here, the sub September uprising uh, at Attica, the Attica revolt had taken place in September. That's touched off many of the revolts that he was dealing with in France as well. And then in 72, he actually visits Attica himself. Uh, he meets with a committee in, that had supported that. And he walks out of there and they, you know, his interviewer asked him, what did you learn? He said, I learned that power is productive. I learned that power is productive. It's not just repressive, it is productive. Well, to me, that was, you know, when I first heard that, I thought, oh, he learned that literally by walking in Attica, seeing what was going on in Attica, and then taking that back and, and theorizing that. I now look at it very differently. I see him walking out of Attica going, yep, what I'd heard is mere reports in France, I could actually see, because he was never allowed in the prisons um, in France. Um, I could see directly. And so that's a really a culmination of an insight that had been growing for him for many years, that power is in fact productive. Um, so I, you know, what's the relationship between the Jeep and Foucault? I think that's really one of uh, the central ideas uh, that, uh, that, that he took from that group, that he learned from his engagement with that group, um, among others. Yeah, and I think it's nice to situate situate Foucault's involvement with the Jeep um, in relationship to what, what, has, what has happened in the 60s for him. So the, the immediately preceding decade, right? He comes out with Madness in 61, uh, uh, Raymond Rousseau um, in 63, The Order of Things in 66, and then Archive of Knowledge in, in 69. And, and there's, there's a sense, if you can imagine producing those four books in a decade and how you feel. And he says, he says in an interview about the Jeep, he says, I was feeling 
like suffering from the lassitude of the literary thing, literary object. He's just like, what are we doing making these books? Right? What is this thing that we're doing? And he says he had a certain frustration, he says, with university yakking and book scribbling at that point, which we know didn't last because he goes on to do more of it. But um, but there's something, there's something that there's a limit to what this academic world can be. And he says, and he says, I was driven to this effective work of the Jeep, driven to this effective work. And he wanted, he uh, he definitely wanted some a different experience. He wanted his transform his thinking to be transformed. I think he wanted more than his thinking to be transformed. And so I think we we might even uh, connect. I wonder if there's a connection between his his move to kind of. Um, specifically practices of the self and ways of life and thinking about what is it that we do with our bodies, like that kind of emphasis um, following the Jeep, I think, I think is rooted in some sense in this, this new effective work um, in contrast to the literary thing that, that turns right here in around uh, the early 1970s. But I would also say Foucault's friendship with um, Liv Rosé, who's one of the um, prisoners who he was working with on the inside for a while and then who got out um, and then he it ended up, Liverse ended up leading the Prisoners Action Committee. So Liverse was a really important figure in both the Jeep and then the, and then the Prisoners Action Committee after. And Foucault developed a, a real friendship with him enough that um, apparently Liverse, when he got out, his first phone call was to Foucault, right? Hey, I'm out. And Foucault said, come over, right? That's, that's, that's how Liverse tells the story. Um, and Foucault apparently, likewise, was, you know, something would break in the house, apparently a washing machine or something else, just delivers it, hey, <laughs> can you come over, let's work on this together, let's hang out. Um, and it's a relationship that was close enough that delivers it to this day, will, um, and Nicolas Dro talks about this in an interview I did with him, but um, delivers it will, will remember and cry about the loss of Foucault, right? If you can think of a friend who you've lost, and it's been decades and decades and decades, and you can still cry. It's still something that lives like that kind of painfully um, of a loss. So I think there's, there's something important to emphasize about the intimacy of that relationship that was this kind of through line between the Jeep and the Cap. And then to think about Liv Rosé's own book, which comes out in 1973. Liv Rosé writes this book called From Prison to Revolt. And in it, he says, clearly riffing on Beauvoir, he says, one doesn't, one isn't born a delinquent, one becomes a delinquent. And I, I see in that book clearly a beginning of, of, of what Foucault does in the very end of Discipline and Punish on the, on the structure of delinquency and illegality and its productive measures for society. Why it is that a society would produce delinquents and um, its relationship to illegality. So I, that's one, one, there's many ways to tell the story of the Jeep's uh, kind of role in Foucault's intellectual development, but I think highlighting um, his frustration with academics at the time, and then his one one of the relationships that developed, which was with Liv Rosé, is helpful. Um, Karen, that, we should also talk about. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we're growing short on time, so I just want to make sure we get this in. We should talk about the Jeep's legacy and its its relationship to uh, prison abolition and the prison uh, critical prison studies today. Those sort of interests that are, are contemporary, because as we open the book up, right, as we open our introduction, one of the things we're saying is that we want this archive, as you mentioned earlier, to be a tool for not only thought but activism today. So if you you, you might start off addressing a little bit that, then I can I can come back in and then to conclude that. Yeah, I mean, there's so there's so much to do there. I mean, one of the things I would say with Foucault studies, so what does this have? What does this book have to do with Foucault studies? I think it really helps us to think about the root of theory in activism, and not just in activism, but in um, material struggle. And as Kevin said, it's kind of a creaturely politics, which is a phrase we get from Lisa Gunther in her essay in Active Intolerance. So thinking about the roots of theory in activism, material struggle, and creaturely politics. This is an archive that helps us think about that. This helps us do that. Um, it's relationship to critical prison studies. I think it's important. Um, I think critical prison studies does pitch itself as a field for today, which it is, and a field about today, which it is. But um, there's certainly a key to today in our histories and in our past, right? And in archives of resistance, in histories and legacies of resistance. And specifically, not just of resistance, but of decarceral communities. How does one build that? 
what do they look like? Um, and I think the Jeep is one of those. Um, and then lastly, prison resistance movements in general. I think the relationship that what this book calls us to think about is that prisons are not someone else's problem. Prisons are everyone's problem. Um, prisons are not just because carceral logic has spread and touches everyone's life in some way or another, whether specifically a relationship to prison, to the structure of a prison or imprisonment or prisoners in one's own family and one's own sociality, one's you know, students and beyond. But um, but also just that, so it's not just that carceral logic, but or it's, it's not just that, that it's the prison itself, but it's the carceral logic and, be, and beyond that, that we live in a, in a society in which our lives are imbricated and interlocked and in which the structures, specifically for radical philosophy association, right? The structures of oppression and the ways in which these things get um, tactically driven are connected. And so to understand them and to unpack them and to loosen them must be a, a coal, coalitional project. But Kevin? Yeah, so I, I'll, just, I'll just conclude on that. That's excellent. I, I just wanna add one thing to that. And that is that, well, let me add two things to that. One is, and I just wanna reaffirm what Perry was saying about this, is that uh, the Jeep, are dedicated and the, and the legacy of the Jeep, I think is dedicated to showing is that what looks to be merely marginal institutions um, at the extremes of society. It's where we lock away uh, those who have infringed and violated the, the, the terms of the social contract, we could say prisons is actually not at the margins of society. It's, it's, it's the logic that applies there is in extreme perhaps, but it's, it's suffused throughout the entirety of the social body itself. So this is, you know, we live at the, as Foucault says at the end of Discipline and Punish, we live in a carceral archipelago, right? We live in a set of nested institutions that are related to one another that are all driven by disciplinary panopticon practices. So uh, panoptic practices. So that, that I think is one thing to take away from it. But the other thing is a lesson to sort of take away from them. And I, I think this is one of the real, you know, Foucault, when he was asked about it and others, but certainly Foucault, um, when he was asked about the GP, he always thought it was a failure. And Perry has excellent work on, what does it mean to fail and what could that actually, uh, how, do, how should we actually think about that? But just taking the mundane sense of that for a moment, his disappointment in it, right? It didn't accomplish what it should have accomplished. One of the sources of that seems to me, and we talk, we have this documentation of this, this is all the way in 1980 where Foucault is still talking about this. Um, it, it, one of his frustrations with the group is that it was always co-opted into a reformist project. And we see that today with abolition, right? The struggle for abolition is what that means is, well, we need you to propose a better way of incarcerating people when that's precisely what's to be called into question, right? Not, oh, how do we do prison better? But why are we doing prisons at all, right? What, what does that have to, why are we uh, assigning guilt and blame in this way, right? And punishment in this way. And Foucault is continually frustrated by the demand that if you expose an issue, if you expose a problem in society, that you also have the onus placed upon you to propose its reformation, right, its reform. And um, he, he pushed back against this continually. He said, we just provide you the information. We don't, we're not trying to build a better prison. That's what people have already tried to do. We investigated those, the second of the, of the uh, intolerable um, pamphlets is on the the prison of the future, right? Uh, uh, and what was purported to be a, a more humanitarian form of prison. And Foucault is, is continually saying, and others as well, he's not alone, uh, that that was never our mission. Our mission was to call into question, to problematize, to use that term, um, to problematize the very uh, sedimented view uh, that we've received that if someone has violated the social contract, if someone has broken the law, then the right thing to do about that is to incarcerate them to punish them in some way. And Foucault is saying, if we're really gonna have abolition, I'm putting words in Foucault's math, he didn't put it this way. Um, but if we're really gonna pursue problematization of the carceral logic of society, if that's what we mean by abolition, and he thinks that is what we have to mean by abolition, then we got to be done with the prison system, not just in the sense of getting rid of, rid of prisons, we have to get rid of the prison logic that we still operate under, right? So I think this is a really important frustration that he felt about the Jeep and how it was co-opted by reform. And we suffer that same kind of problem today, right? If you say, well, you know, we want to defund the police, we want to defund the carceral society, we want to, you know, 
abolish this kind of way of life, then the onus is immediately upon you. Think of us, please, a better way of doing punishment when that's precisely what's trying to be challenged. And that line between reform and abolition, reform and problemization is I think really, really important and an important legacy of the Jeep as well for today. So Brandon, I think we've, we've moved through our discussion there, our topics. Are there questions or issues that you'd like to bring us back to or problems or so, questions? <clears throat> yeah, well, that was really uh, exciting and provocative and interesting. So thank you so much. Um, right now, I'm not seeing anybody commenting. Oh, I do have one coming in. Oh, a couple, very good. Um, so Kat asks on Facebook, um, how do you see this as being a tool for activism and could you, um, maybe share specific examples that would highlight the kind of application you could see sort of coming forth. Perry, I'll let you go first since I was talking last. I think the question of, um, to return to the tactic of information, be useful to think about. So this, this is about 50 years ago in, in France, right? Um, and so the information there was for example, written on sheets of paper or scraps of paper and smuggled out. Um, that, was, that was the way to get the information out. And I think there, there's a shift in the information economy in general, um, in the US today especially, and, and certainly therefore, I think in prisons as well. So there's a lot of the efforts that have been made to um, do prison radio, for example, do journals and magazines from prison to get artwork out um, from prisoners and, and out into the world. So all of those, and then to do the coalitional work of, to, of showing up and building community with. So I'm thinking about, again, about Lisa Gunther and her involvement in the Riverbend um, security unit and the, and the ways in which she's reflected on that and the relationships developed there. And then some of those folks who she worked with wrote um, pieces that are inactive intolerance. Um, the edited collection I did with Andrew. So there's, I think, to think much more robustly about what that information struggle looks like today with the specificities of today is, is one of the legacies, perhaps. Yeah, I would just add to that that one of the other tactics that you see the Jeep use and would need to be rethought for today because as Perry was just saying, I completely agree with what he's saying there, that the um, informational economy has fundamentally shifted and changed. But one of the tactics they used was trying to get experts within the prison system itself, right, to speak out. So um, famously in, in the case of the Jeep, this is Dr. Edith Rose and um, the, the Rose report on the atrocities that took place at Tool is a very journalistic documentarian uh, view of you know daily life in in the prison at Tool and you know the the reasons why the 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 uprising the revolt took place there initiated certainly uh, there so I think that that is a tactic and, and Foucault theorized that later as a specific intellectual and this is clearly the kind of of, of activity he had in mind when he was thinking about specific intellectuals. I, I think that model can be useful for us even today for authorities, experts within the prison system itself, itself to speak out about what's going on there. But I think clearly you have to rethink the, because the informational economy has changed, you're gonna re have to rethink how that operates and how that, how that works, right? How, the, um, how, that doesn't, how that doesn't become simply another bureaucratic report, right? On, uh, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of this form of incarceration over that form of incarceration, which you can imagine there would be, you know, carceral reports of so, of some kind or another like that, reports on incarceration, uh, incarceration like that. But to have them really be able to be uh, shocking, which is what the Rose report was, uh, in its just um, journalistic documentation. Foucault is very interesting when he comments on that report. He says it's not moralistic. Right? It's not uh, Dr. Rose saying, this shouldn't happen. This is inhumane. Those words are never there. Her words are always, they used a restraint device in this way. Uh, they did not call me when they should have. They went ahead, you know, it's just documenting how the, how the inmates were not allowed to have access to psychological services. She was a psychologist, psychiatrist, I'm sorry. Um, and so she was not able to actually perform her role there. Well, we need similar kinds of uh, reporting and truth telling uh, to go on at least, right, uh, as another tactic or model for activists today, I would think. 
So uh, I have a couple more questions on Facebook, but I want to cut line and, and situate myself here just because um, there's something interesting you've both pointed to and said that kind of wanted to sort of let you tease it out if you wouldn't mind just a little bit, uh, which is to say, you know, I, I picked up on this idea of depoliticizing or repoliticizing the prison as an institution and then its logics, but then also uh, prisoners themselves. So uh, exer the exercise of voice and political agency by prisoners and through prisoners. So there's, there's politicizing the institution, but there's also self-politicizing in the form of, of agency of people who are incarcerated. And then I think the sort of other factor here is this epistemological question. So the idea, not only then do you become a political agent, but you become a political agent by becoming an agent of knowledge. So I, was, I, I don't know if I'm framing all this correctly, and these are our sort of classical Foucauldian <laughs> concerns, but maybe you could help me sort of see the, the connection of these various points that, which is to say, politicizing the institutions, uh, gaining political agency, and then this question of kind of epistemological agency. Um, and the, the way that those constellate here. Terry, I'll go, I'll go first on this one if I can. I, I want to pick up on the notion of epistemological agency here because I, I, Brandon, I think you're exactly right to, to, to tap into that because I think it's really significant here. It's clearly significant in the way I was just talking about specific intellectuals like Rose. They have a kind of epistemic authority, right? By virtue of their credentials, literally their credentials, their training, their expertise gives them a kind of insight into the, the, the logic of the institution that others would not have uh, that, that knowledge uh, and therefore not be able to have that kind of insight. So that's one kind of epistemic um, uh, insight that, that is politicized by virtue of the situation that's in. But I also wanna talk, so this is the other thing you're pointing us to, is that there is a kind of epistemic agency uh, by giving, the, giving, giving them the, the floor to the prisoners, right? To let them speak of that which they know. And there's a really interesting line at the, it's in the introduction to the letters of HM. So this is a, a prisoner whose letters are published under the, um, under the pseudonym title of, of HM uh, and by the Jeep, it's the fourth, uh, it's in the fourth um, uh, uh, intolerable pamphlet, the one entitled prison suicides, right? Uh, and they play on that term, it means both suicides that took place in prison, but suicides that were caused by the prison, right, is the uh, other idea of that. Um, and uh, HM's letters uh, are printed there in all of their kind of extreme extremity and, and they're uh, um, all over the place. And uh, th there's a documentation there of a kind of mental breakdown going on uh, as well. But the thing that I think, you know, and those letters, I recommend them to everyone. They're one of the highlights of the volume as far as I'm concerned. It's really, you could dive in and see what's, you know, the, the desires and the, the traumas of an everyday life deteriorating under incarceral uh, logic goes through there. But one of the things that's interesting is that in the, in, in the introduction to that, uh, those letters, in a piece that was left unsigned at the time as the whole volume was uh, anonymous in terms of editorial um, uh, framing, but we now know was uh, Deleuze worked heavily in this, as so Gilles Deleuze and Daniel Deferre did this introduction, uh, literally wrote it. Um, and at one point they say, what we see in HM is what goes on in a prisoner's life. So it's not just about HM, right? That's, they weren't publishing just the personal, right? Uh, which only HM has epistemic agency about epistemic access to. But they were doing it because they thought it provided access to what prisoners in general, inmates in general, uh, were, were thinking, it's how they experienced their lives. It was a way of doing, as they call it, this is their term for it, lived analysis of that life, right? Of incarceration itself. And I think that that's a really important uh, uh, epistemic insight that you can only get from someone who's undergone that life that way. Perry, if you have things you wanna to add to that or other matters. Say that if we're thinking about, about politics in particular, I was trying to find the, the line, but Foucault says something about um, essentially what counts as political here is the gathering of folks to resist what is the intolerable. And so it, it, isn't, it isn't some kind of more technical or kind of higher order activity. It's not something that's limited to particular sorts of actors, political actors, but it's, it's, it's a much more shared visceral um, 
turning against, turning to resist, turning to say no, no more of this um, in, a in a gathered sort of way. Um, so that seems important to me. And then I will just flag um, Ellen Siksu. We had the, I had the delightful opportunity to interview Ellen Siksu. She's one of the folks who hosted the Jeeps meetings um, besides uh, Daniel DeFerre and, and Michel Foucault. Um, she was good friends with, with them. She was one of the, the steady agitators involved in the Jeep. And she hadn't spoken a whole lot about her experience with the Jeep on record. Um, and so I was able to, to interview her about what she remembered. So I think I did this in 2019, maybe. Um, and, but one of the things that she says is, so I say, hey, you know, there's, there seems to be this, this emphasis on the, on the creaturely, but then also the political or the quotidian and the abstract or the, you know, material struggle and the theory, right? And that seems to be part of what the G brings together. How does it bring it together? Why does it bring it together? And she says, this, she makes this really memorable statement. She says, and, and I remember the way she said it, she says it like, oh, Perry, that's this silly question. You know, she says, it's the same thing, of course. Um, I don't believe in abstract things. They are all inscribed in reality and in the flesh. They're all inscribed in reality and in the flesh. And so um, when we think about what politics means in this context, I like to hear both Foucault's comment there about the gathering and resistance to the intolerable, and then Sixtu's claim, there is no everyday versus political, personal versus political. There is no specialness to the, to the political. It's inscribed in the flesh, it's here. Uh, that's that's really interesting stuff. Um, I want to go ahead and then turn it. What I think we because we only have a few minutes left, and and you all please feel free to say we have to stop. <laughs> um, but there there's a, a few minutes left. So what I want to do is I'm going to sort of give a few of these questions that are on Facebook. There's actually several, <laughs> uh, and then you all can sort of choose what you really feel that you would like to respond to and, and maybe we can and, uh, finish up with that, that response. So one asks, um, would you be able to discuss further uh, how this would relate to care of the self? And in particular, um, it says the work begun in uh, whether or not this extends the work begun in response to the GIP or the, the GIP, GIP rather, sorry. Um, and um, also he says, he asks particularly because he's wondering in how coalitions of self-carers could form and contribute to broader social movements like prison abolition. Um, we have another that's asking about how this would relate to and, and what you might think about uh, questions of restorative justice and the theoretical frameworks developed around that concept. Um, and then finally, uh, questions about uh, uh, motivated ignorance as those are understood. And the person says here um, that she's thinking particularly of questions of white ignorance. So would the kind of, when we're talking about these epistemological questions, should we be thinking about questions of motivated ignorance as well? So those are three different uh, questions. There's only three minutes left. So, uh, but choose what you'd like to respond to. And, and I'm personally quite happy to go a few minutes over if you, if you don't mind doing so. So respond as you please. So Periel, if you want to go, or should I? Um, I'm not sure what, which, I mean, all of them deserve a lot of attention and I, I do need to be fairly prompt here. But um, so I'll just say um, in relationship to restorative justice, there is certainly one of the most consistent demands of the Jeep and the CAP was the abolition of the criminal record. I think in many ways they theorize this because um, the criminal record becomes, continues to become this stamp that simply says this person is lesser human, lesser able to be involved in work and family and community service and anything else, right? It's this, it's this excuse for uh, discrimination and, and exclusion after release, certainly, long, forever after. And so there's, I think there's, this, this is one of the threads that certainly insists on the fundamentally human value and, and um, that is not erased by uh, an experience with the prison. Yeah, if I could just pick up and, and affirm that, I want to, then I want to talk about one of the other questions, but um, I think this is really, really important because this is an example of where the Jeep gave uh, the prisoners 
the, the floor and said, what do you perceive as the real problems of your life? And repeatedly came back this answer, we need to have our, our record expunged, right? That's, we can't re-enter society if we have this, you know, holding us back and it did, right? So I do think, and that plays right into the notions of restorative justice. What does it mean to restore someone who has in, infringed uh, the terms of our society? Um, how do we restore them in that kind of way? And that I think is really central to that. I, I want to talk, I'm tempted to talk about motivated ignorance, but I think that's such a huge topic that I can't do that in a minute here that I've got. So let me, let, and I want to be respectful of, of the time we have left here. So um, let me talk a little bit, just a little bit about Care of the Self. And this is you know highly speculative. I'm not about to make the claim that the Care of the Self is already in the Jeep. That's insane. That's not right. Uh, that's anachronistic. I'm, I'm not going to claim that. But there is, there are insights there. There are rudiments of a concern for what does it mean to be uh, not just uh, free in the sense of unhindered, but free in the sense of uh, forging and fostering and creating oneself. And you see this in the, and let me just cite this, this one uh, piece for this. Uh, you see this in one of the prisoner's griefs, uh, grievances, one of the list of prison griev prisoner grievances. And they say, what we want is control over our lives. Uh, we want control over our lives in the prison, right? So they're not, they're not demanding, let us out of the prison. They're saying within the prison itself, uh, we need to have control. We need to have committees, is what they say, so coalitional, uh, control over our lives and how we will foster and determine our own existence within these walls, right, within this incarcerated constraints. But we want to forge our own lives and foster our own lives there. I would say that that's at least the beginnings of or could, but let me put it a little more cautiously, you could read it as um, a beginnings of a thinking about a care of the self within a carcerated disciplinary uh, uh, di uh, diagram. And what is that really, how, what the possibilities of that? What would that mean? Uh, I think that's at least the germ of that idea of beginning and you could read it as such. I'm not claiming Foucault did, that's not my point here, but it is at least already there, that kind of idea, that kind of pro problematic is already there. And then certainly the idea of care of the self in the sense of parousia, of telling the truth and being truth telling, that's obviously, I mean, in one sense, you know, when Foucault, we say, turns to that late in his career, uh, he had been doing that in the 70s, right? Quite literally. Uh, he was a Parisist, right? He was speaking truth to power. And uh, that is uh, obviously the thinking of that, what is it, what's the genealogy of the critical attitude, as he called it, um, Foucault called it that. And thinking through that, I think that's also part of what's going on there in terms of care of the self and a coalitional view of that. Yeah, that's about the best I can do in, in a minute. Okay, wow. So that was fantastic. Thank you both. These are, I, you know, I feel like we could continue, I, at least I could continue this conversation for hours. So I greatly appreciate you and, and appreciate the fact that you spent your time with us and really uh, boiled it down so well. I'm excited for the book. I'll, I'll certainly be buying it myself. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll be writing you lengthy emails to, to see if I can't waste your time. So, but thank you so much. I greatly appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you.